So this will be a talk um, called Duo in Unum, and it will be concerning the Lord and the symbolism of the Mass. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The Gnostic Mass is replete with references to something called the Lord. We'll talk today about each mention of the Lord and focus particularly on its dual representations as sun and phallus. It is my hope that some of you will find this inspires your curiosity or illuminates some darkened corner of this ritual. In the core of my heart, I pray that this may somehow lead you to some greater comprehension of the mystery of the Mass. Uh, before I get into the meat of this talk, uh, I want to um, kind of define a term, which is solar phallicism. Crowley refers to the OTO as being a solar phallic order. <clears throat> and um, there's some question as to what this really means. And um, when Crowley used the word phallic, uh, he often would refer to, um, in some cases, he would differentiate between two kinds of phallus. One, sometimes he'd use a, lar a uppercase P or a lowercase P. And, uh, the phallus, from the perspective of, I think, Crowley, as well as the people he was studying, who, some of whom are saints in the Mass, um, is that the phallus is the generative force that is worshipped under a number of symbols. Um, and it's a generative force that in Thelema exists in every man and every woman. As it is written, every man and every woman is a star. And that star or sun is in every one of us, uh, regardless of what you know, our physical bodies look like. And, um, and so not only are each of us individually uh, possess, possessing of a phallus in that sense, but, um, but also the phallus can be represented by the union of the two uh, physical organs so that um, it really becomes a symbol of of generation and and the the root of the word phallus originates from a Greek word that means to swell and um, I mean that can be you know our, as far as our physical bodies go I mean whether you're a man or a woman the generative organs swell and that um, so I think it it's important to just keep in mind that um, phallicism doesn't mean exalting the male you know in terms of human gender over the female um, that it's uh, it's a term uh, about the generative force within all of us. And uh, so, that being said, let's just look at uh, some of the occurrences of the word Lord in the Mass. And I'll just kind of go through it in order. The first occurrence of the word is at the, uh, the beginning of the Creed, with, I believe in one secret and ineffable Lord. Of course, the whole clause in the Creed. I believe in one secret and ineffable Lord, and in one star, and the company of stars of whose fire we are created, and to which we shall return, and in one Father of life, mystery of mystery, and his name chaos, the sole vice regent of the sun upon the earth, and in one air, the nourisher of all that breathes. It's one long uh, invocation of the Lord in various aspects. And I'm going to just kind of break, break this down into its constituent parts. The first part, I believe in one secret and ineffable Lord. One thing that kind of comes out of just looking at this first occurrence is that the Lord is in all caps, which is kind of unusual because everywhere else in the Mass where there's a word in all caps, I think everywhere else, they're all words that are of uh, like a magical formula or they're Greek words or Latin words or whatever that are in some way well, Crowley oftentimes, in a lot of different writings, will capitalize words that are supposed to have some kind of gematria um, significance. And some of the words in the Mass that are in all caps are words that we know he applied numerical analysis to in other areas. So this word Lord, suddenly it's an English word that's all capitalized. What do we do with that? I think that it's interesting to look at the if we were to uh, transliterate the word into Greek and see what the symbolism is there. Um, if we take the O in Lord and 
correspondent to the Greek digamma, which is kind of an older uh, letter, uh, not in modern Greek. And Crowley often used that letter to correspond to the English O. This is kind of more like a, um, a vow in the sense that it has the value of six. And, um, and it looks kind of like an F. You, you have seen Crowley's F, F, F. Um, or he'll like take a vow and make it look kind of like an F. The digamma looks like an F. And they both have the value of six, so you can have six, 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 and things like that. Well, if we take that O in Lord, and rather than corresponding it to Omicron or Omega, we use digamma, the value of the word Lord becomes 140. Another Greek word which also adds up to 140 is hedone, as in hedonism, which means lust, delight, or joy. So if that's you know, what he had in mind when he capitalized Lord, I think the implication there that he'd be suggesting is that in some way the Lord is corresponding to hedone, and that hedone is in a way secret and ineffable. So then the second part of this, this um, section of the, of the um, creed, where uh, it says, and in one star in the company of stars of whose fire we are created and to which we shall return. I mean, he's clearly talking about the sun, one star the, of which we are created. We're made literally of star stuff, as Carl Sagan said in that video we were watching. Um, and we will return to it. I mean, eventually, if nothing else, the sun is going to go nova, and we will all end up right back where we started. And, of course, it's necessary that he's talking about a different Lord here, in a way, or a different aspect of the Lord, because he had already just said that the Lord was secret and ineffable. And if it's ineffable, then what he's describing here cannot, by definition, be the same as the secret and ineffable one. There may be two aspects of something that contains both. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense that it refers to the sun materially. Another, maybe more esoteric interpretation, though, and given that, in a sense, these are all one, is that each of us is a star in the company of stars, and we are the gods of our own creation. We create our bodies and minds and return to our original state after death. So then, the next part of, the, uh, of this uh, section of the creed and in one Father of life, mystery of mystery, in his name Chaos, the sole vice regent of the sun upon the earth. This is a sort of polemic deity, Chaos, that's identified by name, and this is all caps, caps as it's a Greek word that does have uh, numerical significance, which I'll look at. It, uh, it evaluates to 871, and there's other words, um, including pain or sorrow, skotaios, meaning secret or dark, Pharos, a web or cloak. Agnizu, to purify. And Akon, against one's will. It's kind of strange. They may seem confusing and contradictory, but they actually kind of match well with the description of chaos uh, that we find in the 14th Aether of the Vision and the Voice, where chaos speaks to Crowley and says, uh, or Crowley says, his voice comes in a whisper. O thou that art the master of the fifty gates of understanding, is not my mother a black woman? O thou that art the master of the pentagram, is not the egg of spirit a black egg? Here abideth terror and the blind ache of the soul, and lo, even I, who am the sole light, a spark shut up, stand in the sign of Apophis and Typhon. I am the snake that devoureth the spirit of man with the lust of light. I am the sightless storm in the night that wrappeth the world about with desolation. Chaos is my name and thick darkness. Know thou that the darkness of the earth is ruddy and the darkness of the air is gray, but the darkness of the soul is utter blackness. And again in the, in the fourth aether, blackness Blackness intolerable before the beginning of the light. This is the first verse of Genesis. Holy art thou chaos, chaos, eternity, all contradictions in terms. Right, the first verse in Genesis. The world was out without form and void, and darkness is upon the face of the deep. 